Welcome to the Waterloo Recreation Area, one of Michigan's largest and most ecologically diverse state parks. This 22,000-acre natural area stretches across two Michigan counties and boasts the greatest variety of unique ecosystems of any Michigan state park. Waterloo's scenic landscapes were created over 10,000 years ago by continental glaciers. As the glaciers retreated, the melting ice deposited millions of tons of rock and soil scraped from upper Michigan and Canada. Large ice blocks separated from the retreating glacier and melted to form the many kettle lakes of Waterloo. Its rugged glacial hills are covered with forests of oak and hickory, including some virgin stands. Lower terrain is dominated by American beech and sugar maple, interspersed with massive tulip trees. Seventeen lakes are nestled among these wooded hills. Foot trails lead through areas as near to true wilderness as can be found in southern Lower Michigan. Wetlands abound in Waterloo. Big Portage Marsh is the largest and covers over 2,300 acres. It is home to a variety of wetland wildlife, but none more impressive than the greater Sandhill Crane. Standing four feet tall with a six and a half foot wingspan, it is Michigan's tallest nesting bird. Once nearly eliminated from the state, Waterloo's reservoir of protected wetlands have helped this impressive bird make a comeback from just 17 nesting pairs in 1942 to over 20,000 birds statewide today. Every fall, thousands of sandhills congregate in the Waterloo area to feed and rest before migrating to their wintering ground in the southern states. Waterloo's quaking bogs of tamarack and black spruce are home to rare orchids like pink moccasin flower, arethusa, rose begonia, and grass pink. Here carnivorous pitcher plants and sundews lie in wait for unsuspecting insects. Spring-fed wetlands called fens support delicate wildflowers like fringed gentian and grass of Parnassus and provide prime habitat for the Mississauga rattlesnake. Skeletal remains discovered in the area tell us that elephant-like mastodons and mammoths roamed the park soon after the glacier's retreat. From the time of the mastodon and mammoth until the first settlers cleared the land, Native Americans found Waterloo a hunter's paradise, rich in fish, waterfowl, and upland game. Artifacts found in several parts of the park, including scrapers, axes, arrowheads, and spear points, give evidence of many hunting parties. European settlers began arriving in the area in substantial numbers in the early 1830s. They drained the marshes that mired their wagons and cut the forests that stood in the way of their plows. The United States has some of the world's richest farmland, but most in the Waterloo area was marginal at best. Families struggled for years trying to scratch a living from the soils of sand and gravel. Many had given up by the turn of the century, leaving their farms to crumble and fade into the encroaching woodlands. The Depression dealt the last hangers-on a fatal blow. Penniless and discouraged, they turned their backs on their farms and sought their livelihoods in the cities. The federal government purchased these abandoned farms for $25 an acre. By 1936, over 13,000 acres had been purchased in the northern halves of Jackson and Washtenaw counties. The lands were turned over by the United States Congress to the National Park Service, with instructions to develop them for wildlife and recreation. With the nation in the grips of the Great Depression, the displaced farmers found few jobs in the cities. The federal government came to the rescue with the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, and Works Progress Administration, WPA, programs. These programs were designed to create employment while completing public service projects. And with the aid of as many as 350 CCC and WPA workers, master plans were developed and many projects were completed, including campgrounds, public beaches, picnic grounds, and residential camps. Each worker was paid $62 a month. In addition, thousands of trees were planted to help heal the land. The Waterloo Recreational Demonstration Area, as it was called, began to take shape. In 1943, the Waterloo Recreational Demonstration Area was deeded to the state of Michigan to be administered by the Department of Conservation and to be operated as a state park. The name was shortened to Waterloo Recreation Area. Since that time, over 9,000 additional acres have been added. 
Many were purchased with Pittman-Robertson funds generated from the sale of hunting licenses and taxes on ammunition. As a result, most of the park is open to hunting in season, with the exception of land surrounding the Discovery Center and campgrounds. Today, Waterloo is a green island in the ever-expanding suburbia of Southeast Lower Michigan. Within an hour's drive of several million people, Waterloo is still home to nearly every wildlife species native to Southern Michigan. Waterloo's lakes and streams provide safe haven for mink, muskrat, river otter, and beaver. The long abandoned farms reclaimed by shrubs and trees are now home for deer, wild turkey, and other upland wildlife. Yet much is still being done to improve the park's natural areas. Native prairies, once an important part of the Waterloo area, had all been converted to farmland. The Wildlife Division of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources is involved in many habitat restoration projects in the park, including the reestablishing of native prairies. The DNR Stewardship Program is also removing invasive species, including garlic mustard, black swallowwort, and more. Although the primary objective is to improve habitat for game animals, many more non-game wildlife species benefit as well. People are returning too. Over 400,000 visit every year. They come to camp, hike, hunt, fish, pick berries, collect mushrooms, and watch migrating birds, or just to escape the hustle and bustle of their busy lives. There are a variety of accommodations to serve their needs, including two modern campgrounds with shower buildings and electricity, and a rustic campground where one may simply pitch a tent. There are rental cabins available as well. Some cater to families and others to organized groups. Some have modern conveniences, while others are very rustic. Waterloo has eight public boat launch sites to accommodate boating enthusiasts. Those on larger lakes can accommodate pleasure boats, some smaller lakes are best suited for small fishing boats, canoes, or kayaks. For those without a boat, there are also two public fishing piers. 23 miles of hiking trails travel the length of the park as part of the Waterloo Pinckney Trail that connects the two recreation areas. For horse enthusiasts, there are also bridle trails and a horseman's campground. A private concession offers horseback riding by the hour. Newly built mountain biking trails travel over challenging terrain. Each season offers its own complement of outdoor experiences. Fall colors make driving or hiking through the area an incredible experience. Thanks to the park's tremendous habitat and plant diversity, autumn is a riot of color unsurpassed anywhere in the Midwest. From the early reds of Virginia creeper and sumac in late September to the smoky gold of tamarack in early November, Waterloo is an ever-changing tapestry of fall color. And don't forget, this is also the best time of year to see sandhill cranes. Self-guiding crane and color tour maps available at the Discovery Center's reception desk help visitors experience both. In winter, frozen lakes and marshes, often inaccessible at other seasons, become pathways that can lead to interesting discoveries. Wildlife stories hidden among summer foliage are now in plain view waiting to reveal their secrets to those who find them. Some are stories whose endings may not be known until summer returns once again. With adequate snow, hiking trails welcome cross-country skiers and snowshoers. No boat is needed for fishing on area lakes. Just an ice spud, a jigging pole, and some warm clothing. Except for the ever-present man-made noises, winter nights are silent indeed. The quiet is broken as the last remnants of snow melt away. The first to split the night are the voices of spring frogs emerging from hibernation. They seek shallow pools created by the melting snow. Each species has its own distinct call. As spring progresses, the voices change as early emerging species are replaced by later arrivals. The reason for all the fuss is soon apparent, as clusters of eggs begin to appear, clinging to submerged sticks and branches. While the frogs are noisily announcing the coming of spring, wildflowers quietly turn the drab forest into a colorful tapestry. Hepatica's bright blossoms seem to jump from the brown leaves. Spring Beauty's candy-striped flowers add still more color. 
Bright yellow marsh marigold blossoms contrast with the dark marsh waters. Trillium cover the ground like winter snow and then blush pink with age. Migratory birds return in increasing numbers, reaching a peak in mid-May when hikers are greeted by colorful warblers flitting among the trees in search of emerging insects. With spring in full swing, summer is just around the corner when the campgrounds and beaches will be filled once again. However, to visit Waterloo only in summer is to miss some of the best experiences the park has to offer. The Discovery Center is named for Gerald E. Eddy, state geologist and former director of the Department of Natural Resources. It is here to help visitors take advantage of the wonderful opportunities available at Waterloo in all seasons. The staff, programs, exhibits, and trails are here to enhance every visitor's experience to help all develop a greater understanding and appreciation of the park's natural resources and to introduce young, old, and those in between to a lifetime of enjoyable, inexpensive outdoor recreation.